But um, the thing is, is that obviously cutter charges were used because you had to you had to cut the the steel at the base. You had to cut the steel um, in the basement. You had to cut the steel from the bedrock. The steel had to be cut. These forty-seven uh, core columns had to be had to be cu- cut in many places in order for the building to fall in the first place. And from the very beginning, the clearest indication that the buildings had been destroyed with explosives was the very fact that these 47 core columns were not standing. That meant that they had been severed. That's where you're talking about where you're using these cutter charges, where you put, a, you put an explosive around the, 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 the column, and when it goes off, it cuts it like a knife in an angle usually so that the, that the building will fall um, down because those core columns hold the building. But what we saw on 911 was we saw these huge clouds, these pyroclastic, that means very hot clouds, clouds that are containing molten metal. And when I went out to California to, when I first met Professor Jones in 2005, then I went out to my old school at UC Davis to look at the, uh, the, the, uh, the data from the smoke, what we found in the, in the uh, United States Geological Survey of the uh, dust that they had done was that there was a lot of very small, small, tiny balls of molten metal, like much smaller than a BB, extremely small. But this indicated that a great deal of, of the metal in the World Trade Center had been liquid during the collapse, molten. And what had happened is that they, 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 they had to destroy these, these uh, floors. You see, if there had been a pancake collapse, like the government says in, in many of its documents, you would, have these, uh, you would have these 220 floors stacked up, as you see after an earthquake in Turkey or someplace like that. You would have a pancake effect at the bottom with all these stores stacked up, with all these various floors stacked up. We do not see that because all of the floors were pulverized. Even the, the, the floors were poured into pans. There were steel pans into which the four inches of concrete was poured. Each floor was one acre of concrete four inches thick. That is what was exploded and, and turned into these huge dust clouds that went through um, Manhattan. Wow. Okay, we'll uh, pick it up from there when we come back. You know, Chris, I, I think that last time, was it two shows ago, two, three shows back, mm-hmm. I had uh, Tony Zambodi on the show. He's an engineer from New Jersey who's mm-hmm. done great work on this issue. And, and he argued that you can't, uh, based on, on the forensic evidence that we have available and the, the videos and so on, uh, you can't be 100% sure that something pulverized all those floors the way you just described before the break mm-hmm. because it could be that a lot of this rubble basically went down into what had been the basement levels. Mm-hmm. Um, what's your response mm-hmm. to that? Well, uh, it's, the evidence shows clearly that the uh, most of the concrete and a lot of the drywall, all that stuff uh, was pulverized. And the, as I said, when these, uh, the powder was all over Manhattan and Brooklyn, um, people collected the powder, and some people saved it, cleaned it out of their out of their houses, and put it in little plastic bags. Um, some of those plastic bags were then given to Professor Jones, who analyzed it and found that in in five samples from five different parts of Manhattan, they all showed a very high concentration of nanothermite in the thing, in the dust. Very high concentrations, meaning that tens of tons of nanothermite were applied to the building. Furthermore, if you listen to people like uh, uh, William Rodriguez, who was exposed to this dust, people who felt the dust, people who had the dust blowing around them, will tell you that it was very hot. It was burning them. It was, it was very hot, and it was burning them because it contained molten metal, extremely hot, very hot pieces of metal that were in the molten phase. Um, I'm sorry, but there's no other way that you can, you can um, uh, you know, inject molten metal into all of this dust that was flying through Manhattan Without, without having some extremely hot process like an aluminothermics. And, and the evidence we found uh, in Professor Jones' um, you know, uh, analysis of the dust. Well, that, that makes sense to me. And actually, your description of how it was probably painted on to mm-hmm. the floor pans mm-hmm. makes, uh, mm-hmm. does make sense because if you'd had uh, a more normal kind of demolition that was really just cutting the columns mm-hmm. to have the whole thing mm-hmm. just fall, even though that would have generated quite a bit of dust, as normal mm-hmm. controlled demolitions do, uh, right. it does seem very questionable about whether we would have the evidence that tens of tons of nanothermite had been used. You wouldn't need tens yes, of sir. tons to simply sever the, the columns. Yes, you're right, Kevin. And the thing is also is that when you, you have to consider that it was a very well-planned um, demolition, uh, quite unique. Um, 
and that the by having by by pl- applying the nanothermite to the bottom of the, each floor pan, um, that meant that the explosion would destroy everything on the floor above it as well. Um, it, of course, it would it would hit that pan, throw that pan up, dis- pulverize the four inches of lightweight concrete above it, but it would at the same time push down on the floor below it. So it it, it, it you know it, everything was destroyed. Which is what they really wanted. They wanted um, they wanted the evidence destroyed before it even hit the ground, and they accomplished that. Um, Kevin, I wanted to say one thing because when we we talked about this Israeli uh, fund, it's a little bit complicated. But I want to, very simply the way it works is like this: is that Hugo Noy, the company in New York that is, that took care of the, that recycled this, the most of the steel to China, is invested in a comp, in a fund, the Israeli fund called Agua Agro Fund. The head of the Agua Agro Fund is a man named Nir Beltzer. Um, he is also the head of a fund called the Millennium Materials Technology Fund. Okay, well, let me just interrupt you briefly and let people know that if they go to my yeah. radio schedule page at truthjihadradio.blogspot.com, uh, these names and links are posted right up there. Right, good. And, and the thing is is that it's this, it's this MMT, Millennium Material Technology Fund, and Oren Goffrey, he's this guy, um, he was a former executive of Israeli Aircraft Industries. This is the company that makes Israeli planes and, and Bedek. These are the people I talk about in my, my big article, a um, big chapter of my book called The Architecture of, Nine, of, of 911. Um, and he was in charge of their chemical, metallurgical, composite, and non-destructive testing facilities, labs, research, and development. This is Oren Goffrey. This is the, this is the guy... Um, and now listen to what he specializes in. This is this is interesting. He studied at he studied at the Ben Gurion University down in the desert where they where they make the bombs and things like that. Um, but he he is this is his his specialty is um, in specialization in thin films and plasma coating. And he has his degree in materials and process engineering at Ben Gurion University. Ben Gurion University is in the Negev Desert. This is the university that works. Um, uh, very closely with the Israeli nuclear program, which is just next door in Dimona. And, and that's also where this man studied. He also studied, he took training courses at the Nuclear Research Center, Negev, which is part of the Ben-Gurion. So, I mean, Israel is a very small country, and when, when you see a person with this kind of specialization in making um, energetic thin films, they, they have a lot of companies. This, you know, if, if you look at this MMT company uh, fund, you see that they, their specialization is in companies that make exactly the kinds of coatings that we're talking about. And, and even though for many people this sounds very exotic in the year 2005 or 2010, um, it's nothing exotic about it. It's nanotechnology. It's a composite um, uh, explosive that's, that's like a very thin layer of paint. But when it's, when it's ignited at 425 degrees Celsius, it goes off with a huge bang. It's, it has more energy. It releases more energy per gram than any explosive known in demolition. Wow! And so, so uh, you know, you'd have to, I suppose, do a, a pretty careful quantitative analysis to figure out mm-hmm. precisely how much of this would mm-hmm. end up. You know, if if they painted a, a certain thickness mm-hmm. of coating on these yeah. floor pans, you know, how much mm-hmm. total would you end up with, and what kind of effects would that have? Mm-hmm. Well, you know, Professor Jones and those other scientists did that. And they, based on the amount that they found in the dust that they had collected from these six different samples in New York, they were able to ascertain that it was um, on the order of tens of tons. Um, but you know, this is a this is a heavy paint, uh, and it's it's put on as a uh, with a thin layer. Uh, obviously, the, it was a it was a bi-layered material. That means that it had the the active thermite was there, the iron was there, the aluminum was there, and other things were there. And then there was also the addition of a what they call an organic layer. And that organic layer was essential because that created the huge pressure, the pressure that you saw, this, this, the, the explosion. You know, otherwise you just have a, you have an incendiary. But when you add that, that, uh, organic layer, then you have a, then you have the explosive pressure. Okay. And how, how does it get, uh, set off? Uh, yeah. in other words, if you have this stuff all painted on in place, yeah. uh, yeah. that sounds like it's kind of a, a dangerous situation. Um, what, what does it take to actually set something like that off? Yeah, well, that's a good question. They, there's all kinds of ways that they can even put, they can even build wires into this material. There can be nano wires in the material. I don't know if they did that, but um, uh, with a simple, you can have a detonator caps. 
You can have you can have simple old fashioned detonator caps um, uh, put on there with uh, that will be a, that can be a set off by a radio signal or by you know. But obviously they were put off. They were set off in a way that was very very uh, finely tuned so that they they exploded. Um, obviously they exploded a little bit faster than the speed of gravity because the temp- the, the towers fell. But when you think about it. As I talked about before, with that downward pressure from each blast, when each when each floor went off, the downward pressure could have could have been that could have been an acceleration, which made the you know because the towers fell um, in about nine seconds, and and that's a little bit faster than the free fall, and you know that's one of course one of the anomalies of the collapse of the World Trade Center that that gave people very early on um, an indication that this was not a natural collapse of any sort, that this was a explosive event. Right. Well, I'm actually going to be having a another guest on in the not too distant future, who has discovered uh, this demolition computer technology. These programs that allow you right. to simulate all different sorts of demolitions, top down, you know, bottom up, uh, explosive, uh, anything you want. Put your explosives in 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 thin layers like like this, or however you want to arrange mm-hmm. your explosives. You do it uh, in in the simulation. And then you can see mm-hmm. what happens, and you can fine tune over and over and over. And uh, and she's convinced that that's what was done. Uh, and or and that makes it you know according to to this guest uh, mm-hmm. who will be on in about two weeks, it would mm-hmm. have been actually pretty easy, and a very small number of people could have set up these these very complex.